Toward the end of last year, Oxford Dictionary declared post-truth their word of the year. They define it this way. Relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. And I know this is something that gets thrown around pretty casually these days, but I think in a nutshell, it's fair to say that this concept and the things that grow from it are the explanation or at least a big part of the explanation for why fuckface Von Clownstick won the presidency. Well, there's at least one member of the secular community who's taking this all very seriously and has launched a campaign to bring truth and rationality into politics. Gleb Sipersky is the founder of the Rational Politics Project. What our goal is with the Rational Politics Project is to get people to be more oriented toward the truth than they currently are. We have people like us who are more reason-oriented already care about the truth, and it's really hard for us to grasp that so many people out there don't that uh, we really are outliers from the majority of the population. And speaking to them in a way that you know, presents facts first and logic first simply doesn't work for them. That's what the research in behavioral science shows. So I'm a scholar, I'm in behavioral science, and we're trying to use behavioral science to speak to people where they are. Now, it seems pretty outrageous to me that this is a conversation we even need to have. Why the hell do we have to convince people to care about truth? Of course, we basically know the answer. When Gleb reached out to me the first time, one of my first questions was about whether or not this was actually a new phenomenon. We hear politicians brazenly lie all the time. Is this all really new? My thoughts on that is that it really is on a different level. And there's a really a quite new phenomenon where politicians not simply lie, but they don't back away from their lies when they're called out. So that is the new thing. Oxford Dictionary shows post-truth as a result of the Trump election and Brexit. In both of those, especially the Trump election, we saw situations where there was very clear evidence that mainstream politicians like Trump and uh, his administration and then the Leave side of the Brexit campaign were lying. They were called out on their lies. And instead of backing away, they doubled down on their lies and actually attacked those people who called them out on their lies. And the next logical question is why? If this is really a new phenomenon, or at least something that's happening on a different level than it used to, what's the explanation? The obvious answer is social media, or at least one of the obvious answers. I've heard claims more than once that Trump was memed into the presidency, but Gleb says there's more to it than that. Research from the most recent polls that I have at my disposal shows that about 62% of adults in the U.S. are getting their news from social media, which is up from um, something like 49% in 2014. So that's kind of one thing. And people who are getting their news mainly from social media generally aren't able to discern, to tell whether the news is high quality or not. So a study by Stanford University showed that they were conducting a study on students, high school, middle, high school, college students, they showed that about 80% of study participants couldn't tell apart a Facebook post that was shared by their friend from a Facebook post that was sponsored, so an advertisement. Then the people used really weird things, uh, weird to me, things to determine the credibility of a post. So, for example, many people thought that a post on Facebook was more credible if it had a larger photo. And this episode gets the explicit tag just for this one. Are you fucking kidding me? I just, I, I don't know. Let's keep going. Another big factor is the de deterioration of the news media and decrease in trust of the news me in the news media. So in the United States, uh, over the last couple of decades, the news media has been decreasing. I think something like more than half of Reporters have been fired, so there's less investigative journalism. The journalism that there is is of lesser quality because less people are focused on it. They kind of more do reprinting of news that are passed out, so there's less evaluation, fact-checking. There's more opinion-driven reporting. People want to hear opinions, and they gravitate to sources that are opinion-based, which is one reason why Fox News is so popular and MSNBC News is becoming more popular, as well as lack of trust in the media due to political actions. So Trump has been notorious for attacking the media. From 2015 to 2016, 
trust among Republicans in the media has dropped by more than half. It was in the mid-30s, now it's in the teens. At this point, I'm still kind of fixated on why. I mean, we've explained the mechanism, how it works in practice, but why does this work? Why is all of this post-truth stuff effective? We don't have edu- education on how to evaluate information, especially on social media. So the traditional means of getting information to people has been through vetted sources like newspapers and TV, which have reasons due to their credibility and ethical standards to report news accurately. So people didn't really need that much education in how to evaluate the media. Now, I would certainly have liked people to have information. There are certain systematic problems with the reporting of news due to news ownership. Now, when there was the transition to social media and, you know, 62% of the population getting their information from social media, not only, but, you know, at least some of their information, there's no control on social media. There is no vetting of sources on social media. And as we can see from these studies from Stanford University, people really can't tell what's a sponsored post and what's not sponsored post. They can't tell what's a good thing and what's not a good thing. Okay, so we've done a pretty good examination of the problem. My next question is, how do we solve it? What are the practical ways we can take this information and make things better? Gleb had a great example of this. You may have heard me talk on the show a few times about going on conservative talk radio in Cincinnati to talk about trans issues. One of the hosts I've been on with is named Scott Sloan. He's a pretty moderate Republican, and as moderate Republicans go, he seems to be a halfway reasonable guy. Gleb had a chat with Scott about the demonizing and stereotyping of Muslims and was actually able to change Scott's mind on the issue. Check it out. There was an attack at Ohio State University by a Muslim who rammed his car into some students and then ran around with a knife and stabbed some people before he was shot. So that's what I was on Scott Sloan's show to talk about. Now, as a conservative, like you said, he's a half-decent conservative, but he's a conservative. He was uh, quite critical of Muslims in this situation. And so I talked to him about this, and... I didn't say, you know, you shouldn't be critical of Muslims. That's not about, you know, that's not just, that's not fair. That's not civil rights. These are things that I care about. I care about justice, civil rights, fairness. And that makes me a liberal. So research by Jonathan Haidt and others shows that that's what liberals care about. Conservatives care more about other things. They care about things like security and safety, purity and traditionalism. But in this case, security and safety was the overriding concern. So I didn't talk to Scott Sloan about what I cared about. I talked to him about what he cared about. I made an emotional connection with him. So getting him to care about the truth for making an emotional connection, I said, hey, Scott, you know, it's natural to feel angry about this. It's natural to feel frustrated. This is what we as human beings feel. You know, so when we experience such a frightening thing, and we all want safety and security. You know, I want safety and security to me. It's secondary to other concerns. But I made an honest statement that we both want safety and security, knowing that he cared about safety and security foremost. So let's look at the number of attacks by Muslims. In 2015, statistics show that Muslims committed six attacks on terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. Now, there are about uh, nearly 2 million adult Muslims in the United States, 1.8 million to be exact. And so if we divide 1.8 million by six, we get one in 300,000. So 1 in 300,000 Muslims will commit a terrorist attack per year. If you focus on Muslims, you get so many false positives. You have 299,999 out of 300,000 are not going to do anything. That if you focus our resources of safety and security on evaluating Muslims, we will miss the actual terrorists. We will be less safe and secure, Scott, if we do that. So that's one. Then I said, imagine if we persecute Muslims, what will happen? Well, Muslim communities are going to be much less likely to cooperate with us, Scott, and they will be much less likely to help us uh, address the terrorists in their midst. Currently, the FBI is, is quite cooperative with Muslim communities. Now, if we start persecuting them, they will not be so cooperative. <laughs> and that's the second thing I told to Scott. And finally, I said, we already have evidence that ISIS and other terrorist groups are trying to recruit Muslims within the United States using Donald Trump's inflammatory rhetoric against Muslims. And so if we have more persecution of Muslims, we will have more terrorists in the United States, Scott. So we'll be less safe. So all three of these things make us less safe and secure. And as a result of that, he was quite willing to update his beliefs and say that, well, okay, despite the fear and anger that I may experience toward Muslims, 
we need to be kind and generous toward them, even if we don't feel like it. And he made that statement on air, which is quite relevant to what his audience believes. So I took him through this uh, track of empathizing with him. And so here are the meta strategies. Empathizing, putting yourself on the same side as him, then guiding him through to realizing how his proposed solution to the problem won't actually address his underlying concerns, his underlying emotions, and then showing him what will actually address his underlying concerns and emotions. Intuitively, this kind of makes sense, right? It seems to be one possible way, maybe the easiest way, to circumvent someone's cognitive bias. It's obviously not going to always work on someone who's firmly entrenched or someone whose values are so counter to your own that you may not be able to empathize with them or use these strategies. But I think if you're a person who's out to change minds, this is at least a good approach to try. It's important to point out that if we're talking about making change for marginalized groups, this approach takes a metric shit ton of emotional energy. I don't think any one of those positions should feel obligated to do this. I would never tell anyone they should feel obligated to empathize and validate people who are doing harm to them. But if it's something you feel like you can do, maybe give it a try. I think this approach can especially be effective for allies who may have less of a personal stake and therefore won't be as hurt by those conversations. If you're interested in learning more about what Gleb is trying to do with the Rational Politics Project, you can check out intentionalinsights.org to find out more. Gleb has also launched what he calls the Pro-Truth Pledge. It's a pledge you can take that affirms your commitment to truth and politics and discourse. Gotta be honest, I thought it was a little cheesy when I first heard about it, but when he explained more to me, I'm kind of convinced. So um, you can find that at protruthpledge.org if that sounds interesting to you and you want to check it out. <laughs> 